Hey Postables, it's your girl C here. I am so excited today to present to you an interview with the one, the only, Martha Williamson. This has been something I've wanted to do for a really long time and finally everything lined up. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. We talked about the vows we have made, uh, the possibility of more postables, some great behind the scenes stories, and she has an excellent message for all of you postables out there um, that I hope you guys will stick around to see. So without any further ado, here is my recent interview with the one and only Martha Williamson. Hello everybody, I am here with the incredible Martha Williamson. I'm so excited, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about all things the vows we have made, all things SSD. I know everybody's gonna be super excited to check this out and, and get to hear from you personally. Thank you, you know, I've been, it's, I don't know why we haven't done this before, you and I. You know, it's remarkable um, how amazing you have been. Um, first, finding the show and sharing the show with everybody and then interpreting the show. And I mean, I honestly don't think there's anyone out there and this is no reflection on these amazing, amazing um, supporters of, of, of SSD. But I don't know that there's anybody who's managed to get into uh, under the skin of the scripts and see where where you know go beyond the Easter eggs and get into the symbolism, you know, and uh, that's been remarkable. And you you write so beautifully, and uh, and you and it, it's just been so gratifying, Shandell, to, to see um, how how responsibly and and spiritually and and thoughtfully you write about this this show and it's it's made it feel like for me like like yeah maybe maybe i was called to do this because <laughs> somebody somebody got it and then shared it with so many others who get it and you created this remarkable community of people it's amazing Thank you. You honor me. There's been a lot of people over a lot of the span of the life and the love of this show that have definitely contributed. But I just I thank you for for making something that could end up speaking to me in so many ways. You know, I've written about it on the blog, just sort of how it ended up giving me a mirror to sort of look at myself and, and decide, is this the person that I want to be? And like, how can I change? And, and it's been an incredible journey. And you're right. There's been an incredible amount of people that have come around me in the process. And I thank you for letting me have access to so much of it that, you know, oh. I didn't have to do that. You know, that's, it's just so rare that somebody actually invests <laughs> in the community the way that you have and have allowed me to have that privilege. And I've just relished in the ability to be able to share it with so many people. Yeah, you've, uh, there's a, there's a, it's as if you built this sort of arena where everyone can come and celebrate together and then they all take over sections of that arena. Right, and it, exactly. It is, you know, it's really, really been fun and great. And then not to mention that as I get older, tragically, um, although I shouldn't say tragic because uh, every, every day God gives me is a gift. So, but it's um, as it becomes clearer to me that um, I can't remember everything I wrote, but somehow you do. So uh, there have been times, as you know, when I've had to pick up the phone and say, wait a minute, how old was uh, Norman when his mother left? Or uh, what happened to, to what, did we ever mention uh, Shane's sister? And you go, no, no, boop, 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 boop. And you've saved me hours of time being my memory. It's been, uh, it was a true blessing. So that's been great. Well, it's absolutely been a privilege and I, and I thank you for it. And, and speaking of, I think I see something in the background that looks uh, familiar. Is that you a flat you lounge do. sign? That is the original E flats lounge sign. And um, what was it from? Um, uh, when the, uh, 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 you know, uh, which is, you know, you have to remember. From higher ground. From, from higher <laughs> ground. Oh yeah, I didn't hear you say that. Yeah, from higher ground. That was um, not just it. Well, see, and I wore my special t-shirt, my special shirt today. It says E flats 50th. The I'm an E flat. I'm a I'm from my college, Williams College. This is my little, this is my little um um my little attic up here where I have all my Williams College memorabilia. Nice. And um, all my friends, the E flats are the people who um the the college was uh, started by E from Williams, so hence E P H. And the E flats are the we're the singing group. 
and uh, so we it, back in the day it was a it was supposed to be a cappella groups always singing in colleges but mm -hmm. when uh, Williams went co-ed it, it started in 1793 and when it went co-ed in 1972 or something um we we they, we merged so we had instruments we were very popular we went all over the east coast and we sang at all these different colleges because we were the only co-ed group so we have stayed together all these years and every june we get together and we hang out in this attic and downstairs and here in williamstown massachusetts and we have a great great time and we sing again and there's you know it's wonderful you know you can have football reunions where all the guys from the football team get together but they can't play football when they're you know 70 years old but we can sing so it's lots of fun so that's why that was my little tip of the hat to the e flats with the e flats e flats lounge and it also reminds me of the um the that night that we shot that scene it was one of the most difficult shoots we ever ever had on sign Hill delivered it was raining cats and dogs it was not expected at all to um rain and suddenly we got hit so hard and every single location we had we had to scratch and start over with wow. and it was tough and um oliver and shane were originally intended to um uh, kiss each other walking through a park and then they were going to sort of slip away uh, behind a, a column. And we were just going to see her hand on the column and know that they were kissing. And we couldn't go to the park. And we only had, so I saw the stairs that were going up and down. And I remembered that amazing scene from An Affair to Remember, uh, Cary Grant and Deborah Carr, and how he pulled her up the stairs and all you saw were the two people which i th think is just the sexiest scene ever and and i thought we can do that so we covered the the downstairs steps with a little tent and they walked outside and walked up those stairs and um we we did it at the last second and it turned out to be one of my favorite moments ever on sign sale delivered not to mention by the way this sign you see it outside and you also see it inside same sign we just picked it up from the outside. <laughs> everything was done at the last second everything was redone at the last second so and it's kind of an iconic scene now i know so many people were yeah. on tv why don't i get to see this kids why you know i remember thinking oh, i can't believe this is happening and i know a lot oh. of people actually watch that movie after the fact i did even as well just oh yeah we, we we were ready we were all ready for them to kiss but I didn't want it to be like any other first kiss that you're gonna see on a Hallmark show. I wanted it to be something that said it was a very private thing, that it was a very sacred thing in a way, you know, that it was between the two of them and we'll, we, all we need to know is that it happened. And, um, and then of course, then the big one at the end of Higher Ground yeah. was like, Ah, oh, I remember, didn't, weren't we all together when we saw that, all the ladies and stuff? No, that was to the altar, but you had invited me to come out to California. And I remember we watched <laughs> the crowd of people and their reactions were priceless. That's what it was. It was, that's right. It was there in, um, uh, at the church somewhere, I think maybe. Right. Yeah, people were going, oh, oh, it was great. It was lots of fun. That was really fun to, that was sexy too. That was a very hot show. I <laughs> well, I remember some woman, I think I heard her say, oh, hallelujah, finally, because of the tension <laughs> that had gone on. Said, Honestly, really? <laughs> you know, how many years has it been? Yeah, right. Funny. But wasn't that course some, somewhat of the inspiration for the To the Altar screening? Because you wanted to see yeah. all the people sort of, you know, reacting who really knew the show. Oh, yeah. 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 Do you we, want to talk we, a little we, bit about that? how that came about oh, when, when we all met at the yeah the, to the altar uh, uh, to the altar. yeah it was um it was a very special day it was a very special day you know showing that to everybody and all those ladies who are such dear friends of the show it really felt like um have you ever been to a family reunion where you're meeting cousins you didn't know you had it's sort of yeah. like that, you know, it was, and um, I believe I brought my daughter with me 
Mm -hmm. and Crystal and Kristen were there and it was just so natural and we all we all just talked and chatted it was so much fun to surprise everybody because they had al already they'd come to see home and family right, mm -hmm. uh, right. At Hallmark, and they didn't know that I was going to be there so then I walked in and they knew they were going to have lunch but they didn't know that they were going to get to see the show and that it was that was so much fun you know, giving is so much more fun than getting. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a great moment. I mean, I you were gracious enough to have me come out there, and and I knew the secret too, so I had to keep it for yeah. people that were dear to me that I knew that were going to be coming and this stuff. So I I just it was just it was an incredible afternoon. It was one of the great days, and to see so many people be so um, um, just so excited to see each other. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, I could not have, if I hadn't shown up at all, everyone would have had a, a, a complete moment, you know, without me there, because it was still, it was about them connecting to each other. And I would, maybe I was, I don't know, icing, but, yes. it, <laughs> but, but ha, had that not happened, it, it was, it would have been my loss truly my loss just to be uh, not to be able to see what what has transpired between all you folks it was just it was a great day and I have we got some wonderful gifts too that I still have too that I'm, I treasure so I'm wondering so looking back talking about looking back it's been probably about a month now since the vow we have made came out how does that how does that feel to finally have that out there for people to see and to enjoy and what has the reaction sort of been like that you has as you sort of experienced it? You know, um, the uh, it, it was <clears throat> it was a little um, uh, it was sad for me. At the next day, I was just like, oh, because we worked so hard and so long and overcome so many different obstacles to get that show on the air, and um, and it took it took a lot of time. I mean, I I've worked on that show from hotel rooms across the country um you know I'd, I'd write here and i'd write there i'd write in on a plane i'd write you know there was so much work that had to be done on on that script and it was all good it was all worth it um but it was but you invest so much into it that suddenly it's like you're going 60 miles an hour and then boom you just stopped um that night watching all the tweeting going on that was lots of fun and everybody enjoying that and reactions and response and going, no, wow, you know, they, that was fun. Um, I think, I think the thing that hit me was now what? Yeah. And then I started getting texts from Boothie. God love her. She's amazing. And um, Kristen would forward things to me of responses. She was getting personal responses from people who, um, were saying how much the show had meant to them or how much the series had meant to them, but particularly that that episode where they realized that they had ex, um, experienced a loss, you know, someone, a family member, a spouse, a partner, someone had left them. And, and this experience of watching Oliver work through it right in front of us um, and watching the grace that that uh, Shane extended to him was very healing to them. Mm -hmm. And so it made me feel not sad. <laughs> I was so glad that it happened you know, and that, that I was I saw that things were starting to um, things were starting to to get out into the ether you know, and people were starting to share it and people were starting to um, uh, express uh, the the after effects of the show and how they were incorporating what the show meant to them into into their next steps, which is very powerful mm -hmm. for me. And then also uh, Eric is so sweet and he 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 takes these things so deeply into his heart. And so he he it's hard for him to to say goodbye because you can see how how much each person puts themselves into the show. And um, Eric. Uh, just has always been really special about writing to me and calling me and making sure that I'm not experiencing this sort of postpartum distress. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I hear from Jeff and he talks about how he misses it and, and Crystal, of course, and Crystal's doing great. 
And so we all kind of stick together and support each other and encourage each other in, in the, the aftermath. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so gratifying. You know, I, I get on your website just to see what, you know, what's new and, uh, and just to see the people who, is, who are, are still processing the show means that it has a life. Yeah, and that, right. that means everything. Yeah. yeah, people are still processing. Somebody even sent me like a living letter based on that. Oh, yeah. That movie did you just... get the living letter? I put yes, living I letter right at the very top of the show. Very at the top of the show. Yes. I, for a minute, I almost thought it was the farmer thing. And then I listened again. I was like, oh my gosh, living letters. I still think, though, that my favorite one is the one at the end where Crystal says, Does that say Alameda and <laughs> Alameda? Yeah. I didn't expect that Alama, what? Alama Gordo. Yeah, that, that, that was a remarkable little uh, uh, serendipitous moment that I said, I've got to, I want to do a little something, a little wink there to everybody, you know, who goes to the corner of Alameda and Downing. And, um, uh, but, and suddenly it all kind of came through with yaks and, you know, it was so funny that, I mean, you can give Jeff anything and he can make you laugh with it. Absolutely, he's the funniest guy. And I knew that he would just knock that right out of the park. And um, it, was, uh, it was very special. It was nice to start the show with a hello to everybody and, a, and to end it with one. So I guess we'll, we'll skip, so I was gonna ask this at the end, but so now that we're kind of here talking about you guys supporting each other and you guys really missing it, what are your like what are your plans what could science seal delivered be moving forward like what how would you imagine it and and what, what would you do it would you continue down this path um i i sure would love to love to see see it keep going you know i i have i don't know how um i'm not saying i i can't see how it could happen i'm saying i don't know how uh, hallmark is looking at the show um, I, I'm sure that they're paying attention to the great ratings. We got very good ratings. Um, and of course, there's a new president who's, who's you know, creating sort of a new mandate for the, for the network. And so it, it really is going to have to do with how you know, we all fit into that plan. But I don't know what the plan is. So you know, we'll just keep praying and see, see what comes next. I mean, at the very least, I think you should write a book. You know, you should take all your little reviews and your thoughts and put them all together into something so that we have it. You know, I just love what you wrote. And I, I think at the very least, who knows when we do Sign Sale Delivered again, but I'm gonna need that as a reference. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like a complete guide to sign seal delivered kind of a book that has you know yeah, you know, yeah maybe so everything you like never a need a bible know, kind of thing yeah 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 it's well i what i love about it is that you made some sense of all the arcs for the show you kind of sew it together and you can go all the way back to the very very beginning yeah. and see where it was going and where we were finally headed and it's been, and that's rather remarkable when you think about it, since we never knew, I mean, I always knew where we were headed. I wasn't sure how we would get there because I never knew how many um, episodes or movies we'd have to, to, to tell that story. So one of the biggest challenges has always been to somehow leave the door open at the end of every movie for something uh, next and yet make it satisfying enough so that if it never came back, there would have been some sense of closure for the audience. Mm -hmm. It's been always been a tap dance there. Yeah, but I think there are more stories. And this is one thing that I've always wanted to ask you because when I saw it posted to the internet, I thought, why does this, why does this have a C next to it? So a, a cast member, before you guys start filming, always make a habit of posting the front cover of one of the scripts. And I always end up using that front cover of the script as one of the images in Alameda and Downing. This one said, sign, seal delivered, movie 11, C. So it's <laughs> A and to B. <laughs> there were, well, I'll be honest, um, there were two other scripts that went before that. that. And um, so there was there was one that um, had a that had been, uh, if you remember, that um, after uh, to the altar, mm -hmm. there was an announcement that there was going to be a Hallmark 
drama channel. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the first script to make it a, a bit, to take it up a, a notch in terms of drama and, mm. and sort of um, suspense and make, and, and maybe, and widen it a little bit outside what our, our typical A story might be, our typical letter might be. And there, was, there were higher elements of potential danger for the post. Oh. And it just wasn't, um, wasn't in concert, I guess, with what they were still trying to work out with the drama channel. And, and, and I think it was, if I say so, everybody said it was a great script. There's you know, nothing wrong with the script, but, um, they, but there was, um, it was a tone and it was, we were still trying to figure out what the drama channel was going to be. So what if we go this way? What if we go that way? So the original one um, had to do with, was a bit more serious and dealt with more current issues. Ooh. And then we realized, no, you know, I mean, we looked at the dark web, for example, and things like that. Ooh. And which actually, you know, creates a very, very challenging situation for just for the existence of a letter. You know? So there were there, there, there were some very, very exciting things that I had a lot of fun writing. I had a lot of fun writing, uh, but it just didn't fit. It, it, it didn't fit where they were headed, but they weren't quite sure where they were headed. But once they saw this, they said, OK, we don't want to go there. I said, oh, okay, so we, then we started over. So we, we brought it down a notch and made it a, a bit less um, uh, uh, intense and made it a little more quirky. But then by that time, uh, we had a couple of issues. We had um, a new president and we uh, said goodbye to Mich uh, Michelle Vickery. Mm -hmm. And we also, um, had uh, uh, the pandemic came up. Mm. And so there were um, just some real issues about what will this show be and where, where will it be headed? And at that point, I realized we don't know what the future is for Sign Seal Delivered. So let's get Oliver and Shane married while we can. Okay. So that's when I just, you know, so that, so that was uh, 11C. Okay. Got so, it. But, but and I basically did that A, B, and C because on my laptop, if I kept doing SSD eleven, <laughs> you know, I would end up with six different scripts. Right. You know? So um, I just had to go A, B, and C just to not confuse my you know, my hard drive. <laughs> so is there a universe in which maybe we get to see maybe that that other script, that original script that's got that? You know, it's funny you ask that. I just don't know. I'm sure that, I mean, I certainly have them and I, I actually really liked those stories. And, and I think people liked them too. They just couldn't see them in right. the, in the world that they were, and they were, and I think are still trying to, uh, to define. Um, but uh, who knows, it could sneak in as fan fiction one day or, <laughs> Or, um, or you know, I, I think uh, there have been times like with uh, Touched by an Angel, remember we did um, uh, fictionalized books mm -hmm. or we did novels mm -hmm. of the scripts. We did sort of retroactive books. Mm -hmm. Who knows, maybe something like that. I think the funniest thing is that the original pilot for Sign Seal Delivered was actually episode, aired as episode, I think it was, Nine with Carol Burnett. Night? Oh no, no. Carol Burnett was to, Carol Burnett was the ten episode. A hope in a future. Carol Burnett was a hope in a future. A hope in a future. Yeah, this one was. Um, oh yeah, this is the one with Valerie Bertinelli, I think, because it was the one about the the uh, the girl who needed the kidney. We found. Oh, that's Dark of Night. That was episode eight. Dark of Night, and um, that was the original pilot for sign seal delivered oh. but they thought that was too dark if you remember because 
the girl was the result of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not giving anything away to the fans because they already know the right. story. The girl was the result of a rape, you know, right. that's pretty dark. Yeah, it is. And so um, they thought that might be a little too much to start a series off with. But once we started getting going and they could see the potential for deeper issues, then we ended up doing it as an uh, episode, as you remember, eight. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Yeah. So yeah. who knows what could happen to 11 B and C or A and B and B. So you mentioned I, one of the things you definitely wanted to make sure came into this script was that Shane and Oliver got married for the vows. Yeah. Made. What other elements were sort of critical to you when you went to like write this particular version of the script? Um, well, Norman and Rita, their story, their uh, adoption story had were in A, B, and C. Okay. So uh, we carried that one through all the way. And that was a very typical, traditional, classic Norman and Rita arc. And, and very moving and very touching. And that, that meant a lot. Um, I think uh, uh, what in the, in the previous scripts, we actually had gone to, gone to Washington DC and gone to the mm -hmm. McInerney home for the- uh, Retired postal uh, workers. Yeah, so um, in that, in an earlier script, she was, uh, Charlie was actually um, going to be the caretaker of, of that. She's gonna be the, the, the yeah. super, superintendent and the, you know, the custodian of the place. Oh, wow. That is so neat. It's wild, isn't it? Yeah, yes. but, that's, but you step back and you realize that what really matters is just the emotional arc of these three people. And it doesn't matter where she does it or you, as I said, this is why God invented the delete button. <laughs> you, can, you can always delete the where or the when or the how, but you can't uh, just hold on to the what. What do you want to say? And, um, and you can get that story out one way or the other. Why was it important for you to have her to have Charlie and Eleanor be adopted by Norman and Rita? I thought that was so unique. Um, you know, it was really important to me. The overall, um, you know, my two daughters are adopted from China, and I don't mention that very often because it's not been a big, um, you know, issue. I guess would be the word, but it does become an issue when people make it one, and so. What happens, I think, sometimes is, you know, people will say to me, oh, you couldn't have kids, so you must have adopted. And um, as you remember, Norman and Rita in The Road Not Traveled have this conversation that they want to adopt and they want to have kids and they don't know, but they do know that one is not contingent on the other. And I think that's a very important message. And it's something that I felt very strongly about in this show. And there was some discussion about it, um, of why Norman and Rita want to adopt. And I said, we've already established that. We've established mm -hmm. that Norman is adopted and he wants to adopt mm -hmm. under any circumstances because he knows what that means. And that's how I felt. You know, back many, many years ago, before I even met my husband, um, I knew that I wanted to adopt uh, girls from China. I had heard about it. I had heard that um, you know, the children were being left on, on the roads and on mountaintops and in restrooms and in parks. You know, children who, and I can't say they were unwanted, but, they, but, but with the China's one child policy, there were choices that people were making. And I just couldn't imagine that um, to, to just the message that was saying a boy is more important. If you can only have one, choose the boy, don't choose the girl. And that was horrifying to me. And so I always knew that that was something that I wanted to do. And so it would be against who I am and what I believe if I had written a show that said, we can't have children, so let's adopt. You know? And um, so I think it was important to say that what adoption really is, is not um, an, uh, you know, the, the alternative. It is a choice to uh, you know, embrace so much of, of 
of what love is and, and what what love needs and what people need from from us whether they're babies I mean we are you know biblically we've been adopted into you know into the family of God and to me that's what I I was trying to say in some small way that I knew our our you know devoted you know believing viewers would recognize immediately that that there is a there is something wider about adoption adoption is your first choice in many ways not your second adoption is to is to take into your heart and into your home anyone you know who who needs your love and um i you know my mother used to talk about adopting all kinds of people and and she she said she had her adopted um Korean son who was a, a, a captain in the Korean uh, Air Force who had come to the United States to be trained um, after the Korean War. And he was 21 and she, and she met him and she just said, we're adopting him. <laughs> so the word adopting to me is just an extension of saying, we're taking you into our hearts. I love that. <laughs> I feel like that that just, that just changes my perspective on a lot of things I feel like. And I feel like a, a lot of ways people have adopted each other. I've seen mm -hmm. situations where it just seems like there's the family there. They well, the, the postables have love. absolutely adopted each other. That's I think that's why I, I was describing those uh, those cousins, you know, at the re, at the reunion. Everybody realized that they were related in by something very special. And it, and so you you adopt each other. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. That was, a, that was a great message that you managed to weave in, but I wonder, were there any things that you didn't get to put in the script, whether there were moments that you didn't get to put in or even moments that didn't make it sort of the final version that we saw? Yeah, um, good question. I was thinking there are two um, really, there's a wonderful scene and I'm hoping that it'll make it into maybe the domestic or the international version. We were just very, very long on this show mm -hmm. and, um, but it's a scene, it's the scene with um, uh, Sharon and Joe. And if you recall, Sharon um, had been, um, she says something about now about those candles, right? But we'd had a little runner that we ended up having to cut where she thought Shane was using too many candles in her, she was using too many candles in her, in her church for her wedding. And so finally, Joe, um, sits down with Sharon and says, what is it with you and the candles? And Sharon says, I have a love-hate relationship with candles. And she tells the story of that Christmas when her husband leaves. So we hear the story again from Shane's mother's side. If you remember back at the Christmas show i believe it was we heard the story from shane and from shane from shane's mother's point of view from sharon she says i stood at the door after he walked out and i didn't know what to do so i just started blowing out it was christmas time and we had all these candles and so i just started blowing out all the candles and when they were all blown out i just sat down on the couch and i just curled up and fell asleep and when i woke up there was shane lighting all those candles again one by one by one and oh i gotta tell you sherry the actress the actor great actor um she knocked it out of the park there was not a dry eye on that set when she when she gave that beautiful beautiful performance and um and it just broke my heart to have to cut that it really ripped me out because I just loved what she did and what she said, but um, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna see if we can get it into into somewhere, somehow some way we're we're gonna get that scene out there because there's it 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 does speak to not just the history of the show and some of the canon in the show, but just about and Shane's resilience, but just sort of you know light a candle in the darkest moment. Are there any other scenes that got cut that? were similar to that or any other like little runners or things? I think I've tried to block it all out. Um, I, 
um, we had um, that Phoenix kid at the top. Oh, you know. oh, he gave a wonderful performance and that really hurt hurt my heart to have to tighten his up a little bit. We he was very, very funny and he 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 sort of helped us reestablish for anybody who hadn't seen the show before what what are the postables and who are they? And he kept thinking, he kept saying, Norman kept saying, let's uh let's let we're called the postables. And he'd say, Well, what about the dead letter guys? He'd say, Yeah, but we didn't say. I like the dead letter guys. What about the dead letter guys? And so, so I missed that because he was just very funny. But I have a bad habit of of writing too much at the beginning before we get to the the A story. So I, I need to. I had to cut a lot of that out. Wasn't dead letters also the original like working title of Simon? Mm-hmm. That was the original working title. Oh, there you go. So you're <laughs> in there too. Well, the fact that you mentioned Sharon, her relationships with Joe, with Shane, with Mm -hmm. Oliver, they, she, she managed to, like, they were very well developed. I felt like even though there wasn't a whole bunch of space to really focus on just those different relationships sort of developing, that she just sort of jumped in and felt like she kind of been there the whole time. How difficult was it for you to put her in in such a way that she was clearly bonding with Joe? Um, you know, her and her relationship was was really was really funny. And then the way that she seemed like she could kind of autopilot, auto interpret Oliver in ways that we had sort of seen Shane learn to do that yeah. Sharon yeah. in the situation already having the vocabulary for. How did like how did you develop that? Those her her ability to sort of do that. I think you described it so well. I don't know if I can get any. <laughs> um, she, uh, you know, every character is going to be some part of the of the author. I think um, the Sherry, Sharon, uh, and that was a complete coincidence between Sharon and Sherry. I don't know how that happened. Um, Sharon is Shane's mother. And in some ways, very much mine, my mother. And and I think very much a lot of, I think this is the reason, as a matter of fact, I would say if there was something that fell out of the script time-wise, it was a little bit of conversation between Shane and Joe about her mother. And the fact that Sharon was a little out there and focused and, and tough to deal with and hard to wrangle sometimes, which is one of the reasons that um, that Shane is so good with Oliver. That she was dealing, uh, that Shane really was dealing with a, a mother who, who'd had her significant other leave and so did Oliver. And Shane knew how to handle those, handle that, whether she was aware of it or not, she had adapted mm-hmm. and found a way, and which is why I think Shane was not thrown because she'd seen it before, consciously or unconsciously. Mm-hmm. Um, the Sharon is a little bit of my own mom, which was, you know, she never pulled a punch. She did, you know, she told you exactly what she thought. And she was, you know, but she was kind and she was loving. But if she, you know, if, if she saw those shoes and she said, My goodness, how do you walk in those shoes? You know, she'll say, <laughs> and um, uh, my and and then there's also that element of sort of the ADHD and I say that or ADD uh, with her where and I I I mean that literally and clinically not just people I I don't like when people just sort of say oh I've got ADD because it, it's it's a real thing and it it does need to be addressed and managed and 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 carefully considered as you go through life. And I have ADD, which for me has been, I I learned how to adapt so that I could use it to my advantage as a writer. And then you sort of keep all these 6,000 different things and somehow you end up with, you know, you, here's mother, here's, this is my Oliver. Well, of course it's Oliver. Why would, or no, you know, there are a million Olivers in the world. Why, how am I supposed to know this is the Oliver? Unless you say this is the Oliver. And why do you wear those shoes? And oh my goodness, something's not right with this guy. He's got a problem. You know, you, all those things go on, but then you have to find moments on to focus and how you, 
how you um, process all the stuff you're seeing all the time. So for me, becoming a writer was that gift from God to say, here, you're a little nuts. I made you this way, and I'm going to show you how to you know, use that. Um, and I think with, with uh, Sharon, um, Sharon McInerney, she was, it may well be one of the reasons that that husband left for all we know, you know, that she was just so, she required an awful lot from him that he couldn't give for one reason or another. Um, this is why I personally didn't get married until I was in my forties, because it wasn't until I met my dear husband, John, that I found somebody who could actually ride the waves of Martha Williamson. You know, he'd say, that's okay. That's your process. You go do what you need to do. You know, I mean, he totally, I don't think he knew he was dealing with somebody who had ADD, but he knew that he was dealing with somebody who had a lot to say, and he was determined to help me say that. And until I found that person who was willing to be my partner, I didn't get married. And I, and I think my guess is that Sharon uh, was um, not understood until oddly enough, till she met Joe. And um, I think that would have been very interesting, but there just wasn't real, really space to explore mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I love that Joe kind of would understand things. And so did oddly enough, Ramon, if you remember, <laughs> Ramon said, yes, a pillar, you know. A, he was a yeah, he he could inter he could hear it where where she was going because in some ways look at all the things he's bounced around and right, with, right? that's right. So everybody has a uh, has something to bring to that party. Right. So I think Sharon was a little bit of me and a little bit of my mom. She was just she was so excellent. I love that that Ramon the uh, the urgent care in Barcelona. Like, <laughs> The little things that you wrote for him and the way that he just interpreted it as if it was matter of fact, like nothing was wrong with it. Nothing was strange. I, I think that that just, they, she just fits so well and they just all gelled so well. And like you said, the relationships, I, I actually really noted the one between um, Joe and Shane in this one, because I feel like Joe has only gotten as close to Shane as Oliver has come to Shane. Because I feel like when he said, mm -hmm. my favorite people, I feel like he could have said that a long time ago, but I really liked how his progression has been that he's only gotten as close to Shane as, or as Oliver has come. So now that he is, that she's gonna become his daughter-in-law, he's now yeah. saying, you're one of my favorite people. And she's also, instead, he does that thing I like to talk about where he expedites, where he kind of gets to the point yeah. and helps other people get to the point a little faster. And I really liked in this one that he actually gave Shane the key to talk to Oliver about yeah. some of what he was going through with, with asking, with telling Shane, you need to ask Oliver about Dunbar and Oaks. Was is this been progression been on purpose or is it just yeah. like a concept? Yeah, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that when you know, when a, a man shall leave his mother and a woman leave her home, that song you know, that mm -hmm. Paul Stuckey wrote, "There Is Love," and the idea that when two people get married, you you need to back off. Um, I, I attended a couple of weddings that Della Reese performed as an ordained oh, wow. minister for church. And one thing that she always said was, um, it was very funny. She, she would say, now, does anybody have any problem with these two getting married? Speak now or forever hold your peace. And she said, and then they'd be dead quiet. And then she'd look and people would kind of laugh uncomfortably. And, <laughs> and she'd say, I'm not kidding. She said, if you've got a problem with these two getting married, you better say it right now, because after that, it's none of your business. We're out of it. It's their marriage. And, <laughs> you know, and everyone would go, okay, Della, you're right. You know, yes, you know, it's not to be denied, Della Reese, God love her. And, and uh, so, but it was, I've never forgotten that, that, uh, and, and so I believe Joe was coming to those days when not that he realized but that he knew that he what needed to be fixed with oliver couldn't be fixed with him it had to be with oliver's wife he had to step out of but he could he could give her the tools that she needed to do what she needed to do for her 
her husband, who was going to be your husband. So I think that was one part of it. And then second, I think um, that they, that as Joe, I wanted something to balance with um, Oliver and Sharon. I felt if Oliver and Sharon were going to bond, we just needed to see that that moment with Joe and Shane as well. Otherwise, it would feel like Oliver was like a bug on a pin, and everybody was focusing on him. And um, and so to give um, Shane some some acknowledgement that she was dealing with this too had to be you know had to be um, acknowledged. <laughs> Right. One of the things I also thought was really neat is some of the ways you, you wove in flashbacks and then you ended up weaving in key women uh, from Oliver's past. What, how, what, why was that important to you? Why did you feel like this was the right exact time for him to sort of have those moments and, and to speak to Norman directly, I think, which kind of was a kind of the catalyst for him to go back and think about those women. And, and so with a moment you always wanted, you, did you always want that moment where Oliver would come, come to Norman and say, how do you do it, you know, to come to him? Because they've always had that really special relationship. And I feel like for a while, for a very long time, Norman was always coming to sort of Oliver. And now, you know, that's being returned with Oliver coming to Norman. Yeah, yeah. And that's, if you also remember, um, we haven't heard, it wasn't until at the very end uh, of that scene with Oliver and Sharon, where he says, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And the last time you saw Oliver say, I don't know what to do, was there in higher ground mm -hmm. when he looked to Norman and said, I don't know. He was in each case, he was bereft. He was absolutely at a loss and in despair. And um, I think, what I have always loved is that Oliver recognized in Norman certain strengths that he could not summon in himself, but he could nurture in Norman so they would be there when Oliver needed them. Hmm. And uh, to, to go over there to the refrigerator, you know, and get the Yoohoo, which is just an act of, of self-care, um, was to um, was to, to 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 say I need I I need something I need help at this moment and then looking at Norman and seeing how Norman seems to have it all together and 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 the roles have definitely flipped so that was that was a reason I put it at the refrigerator I thought there was something about them um, meeting at a place where Oliver goes when he needs some sustenance. Right. Um, also, by the by the way, a little asterisk behind the refrigerator. Did you notice a little sign? <laughs> yeah, it said the what is it? The online shipping has been moved, right? Online shipping has been moved to the terminal annex, <laughs> and we put that we put that up because if you recall, the you know, the 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 DLO that we used this time was so much mm -hmm. more like the original DLO right. and then, you know, and things had changed somewhere in the middle of all of that. Right. And, and I knew it was going to look odd and people were going to say, wait a minute, how come it looked like this? Then it looked like that. Now it looks like the, the old one again. Right. So I put up online shipping has been moved because it, remember it had been switched over to online. Right. Shipping, right? So I thought I've got it. I, Shondell's going to catch that if I don't, <laughs> explain this one way or the other. So I slapped this up. I literally had my, my assistant uh, run out and put something together and he put it on and typed it up and printed it out. And we slapped it behind uh, Nor uh, Oliver before we shot that scene. I had the best, best chance to explain all of this in a tiny little way. Um, anyway, so, so back to Oliver, I think he has been, um, uh, clearly understanding that there's a, you know, there was, something that he needed and it was a, a way to to process this fear that he's feeling that Shane is going to leave him and he doesn't quite understand that and yet what I loved was this is an opportunity to acknowledge great women not just great women characters on Science Seal Delivered, but some of the great women who've been on our show at the same time. Again, 
because we never know if this is the last one or not. You just don't know. And I thought this was a wonderful opportunity because since those times we've lost Valerie, you know, and um, uh, we we couldn't bring Mary and I wanted to bring uh, Valerie, um, not Valerie, thank God, not Valerie Bertinelli, um, but Valerie Harper. And um, I wanted to bring Marion uh, to the, uh, to to the set, but we were in the middle of the pandemic, so we couldn't bring her. So I thought, how could we bring Marion? Well, we can we can um, recall her, and and again, so it just sort of grew out of all of that. If I'd been able to find appropriate uh, flashback for Adela, I would have. But we did. She was dealing more with with uh, other characters, so we never really had the right flashback there. But mm -hmm. ultimately, it really was about what what Norman said, you know, look at all the great women who stayed, look at all the great women who did, you know, give you wisdom when you needed it. And so I love that. I really love that, that scene um, between the two of them. It's really very touching. Then of course, finally, it's, it's shame. And if you remember, he said, I had a forever family, says Norman. Mm -hmm. And Oliver says, forever is hard to come by. Right. But he turns out to be wrong. Because he's had it there, yeah. As a thing for the future, yeah. Well, speaking of the DLL, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about. I felt like after seven, after Higher Ground, that he had transitioned to this new season, so therefore they needed a new hangout. They needed uh -huh. the space. Why was it important for you to kind of recreate the DLO space? Because it, it wasn't it wasn't the same building you guys were in originally. It was actually something that you had them build, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was um, because, again, because of the pandemic, uh, we knew we were going to be shooting in other places. And we also had this opportunity to build on a real sound stage. Wow. As opposed to um, just finding some big warehouse and fixing it up. We had, a, we had a real studio area to build in. And that was very exciting. And second, I just felt we've come full circle with Oliver and Shane. And I want, after so much time away from each other, I want as many things to feel familiar for our cast and for our audience as possible. So it was wonderful. And what was really wonderful was to see how many things had been saved. Because when you think about it, it's been years right. since we've shot one. and. The, um, the credit goes to uh, this wonderful man who, who has worked with um, uh, uh, Front Street for so many years. And he's, Alan is the, what we call the, the line producer and, and one of the producers of, of the show. And he believed in the show so much that the, after, after um, To the Altar, he took what we call um, hero things, things that are very sp specific to our show, iconic things like the, the letter openers, you know, like, um, like the, the, the blanket, the wedding mm -hmm. blanket. The wedding blanket. Saw yeah. that on there. Um, the books, we, some, uh, one of our, um, Michelle is, was our, um, has been our uh, uh, prop mistress person, brilliant, brilliant artist. Um, and she ran around getting all of the Annalise books, Adventures with Annalise. Oh, and if yeah. you look carefully, there are some hidden in, in little corners and the little, a little plane to remind us of that. We found lots of little things like that, that, that between the two of them, they found and hid away so that no other production could just be going through the great oh. world of of props and take them. Right. They, they said, nope, these are signs have delivered. And we, you know, like the, like the Dark of Night Awards. Right, yes. Right, those had to What's be, that? yeah. Yeah. So those were uh, jealously protected by, by believers in Canada who wow. knew we it again. So we, we wanted to make it feel like a homecoming. You know, the Big Bear, Rita Sash. Yeah, the Rita Sash. I mean, that was an amazing find. I mean, it, it was, Michelle just kept running in going, look what I found. I found this too. Oh, I found this. <laughs> I found the, it was wonderful. The one thing, um, we never got the original bear. 
but I'll tell you that was a pretty that was a pretty good stand in there. Talk right. about probably a, a cousin bear or something. And could you find Shane's old desk? Because I, I, there were two, three, two things. I'm like, one, maybe you didn't find her desk. Second, maybe you wanted her to have the permanent desk as sort of that, you know, representation of the fact that she's finally a permanent fixture. Um, so is that? No, we, that broke my heart because I found that desk, oddly enough, here in Williamstown, Massachusetts, just before we started the show. I found um, it was a steampunk design by an artist. And I, I still have pictures of it in the, in the gallery uh, where I found it was an artwork. And I took pictures of it and I sent it to um, the production designer at the time and said, this is what Shane's desk should look like. And so that was specifically made, inspired by, by those other steampunk desks mm -hmm. and inspired. And, and that was ours for all those years. And then it just disappeared as things can happen in a big um, studio. So we don't know, that broke my heart. But oddly enough, there, it, it did provide us the opportunity to have Shane be closer to Oliver's desk. And we built something up and, she, and we really kind of liked what, what we ended up with. And so did, so did um, Kristen. Boothy really liked it, having it up like that. And it, it was, it was, um, it was it was a it was a good alternative. I think it I think we could justify it. I liked the little and on her desk. And was that a yellow rose like stuck in the the like the little ampersand? Yeah, I think okay. so. Okay. Yeah, we did little tiny things like that a lot too. The little yellow rose thing and little you know the um uh, the the letter from the mother at the hospital mm -hmm. was opened with the postables. A letter opener we made sure that that letter opener opened the letter so the postables can say they did it I, I saw that I, I I was I was super excited to see that and I know you had sort of mentioned to me that there was an intent to make sure that that was featured as sort of a little bit of an easter egg there so I know I know we really appreciate it I mean I remember I remember being there when it arrived you know it was that yeah, I remember. It wasn't yeah. gonna make it and then you opened it and you got to read the letter and the scripture reference and see the picture and stuff that was included in it and it was great it was um let me see if I can think of some other things that were said um you know the uh uh there's a, 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 a shot that sort of tracks uh, through all the cubby holes, the pigeon <laughs> holes, yep. as, as Rita is talking with Charlie. Right. And I, we made sure that we had the Paris name right there as they were talking about the, you know, the ex-wife. about right. So it's just all those little tiny things that the deep in it for the actors and certainly for the, you know, the diehard loyalists, you know, makes it, makes it, keeps it real. And then you also managed to create new moments. So for instance, Never My Love, that song, obviously oh. the music, always yeah. an incredible impression and, and creates just these incredible moments within, within these movies. And I know that that one probably has a story behind it because yes, it really does. Uh, Amazing okay. story. Yeah, it has, it's, this is one of those, um god given moments that just brought me to my knees really in terms of gratitude um and and humility to realize that you think sometimes you just think you're alone or you've been forgotten or you just aren't thinking about being remembered by god and then um suddenly something miraculous happens i was um in colorado and I was, I needed to be alone to complete the script. And that happens, you know, you just need to be alone. You need to have complete focus and you can't hear leaf blowers or sirens or <laughs> helicopters or doorbells or dogs, you, know, you just need peace. And so that's where I was. And I was completely alone on, on in a cabin in the mountains. And a friend of mine who lives down the hill came at the to the front door just as I was trying to write that scene uh, with um, Shane and Oliver uh, the the big the big scene in in the in the DLO and I just had hit a wall and I just quit and the doorbell rings 
And my friend, Tom Casey, um, came to me with a box and he said, you know, my brother passed away last year and I've been going through all of his things. And he loved old record albums. And I don't have a record album player, but I know you do. And I know you like music. And I thought maybe you'd like to have these. And I said, that is so sweet of you. Thank you. You know, I'd invite you in, but I'm writing. Right. <laughs> and I wish I could, but I'm really focused on something right now. And I said, come back later and we'll talk. But this is so kind of you. Thank you. So he um, leaves that album there, these boxes of albums. And uh, I sit, and I sit down, I said, okay, Martha, just, just stop and make yourself some lunch. So I started to make lunch and I said, I'll put one of these on. So I flipped through and I see an album that I had when I was a kid. I'd actually worked really hard to earn the money to buy the Fifth Dimension album. And I said, oh, I haven't heard this in a long time. I just pick it up and I pop it on the record player, this old thing. And and what's amazing about that is I didn't even think that I could find the court for that old record player. Huh. And I found it miraculously. I mean, every single moment was just like this little miracle. And I, I there was no cord to plug it in. And then I thought, I wonder, and I, and I, I kept thinking, talk about ADD. I kept thinking, why am I obsessed right now with plugging in a record player when 15 minutes ago I was in the DLO in my head trying to you know, bring Oliver you know, back to sanity. And now I'm trying to play the fifth dimension, you know, classic ADD. So I just followed my gut and I plugged the thing in, I put it on, I started making um, uh, breakfast or lunch or whatever, time passes when you're writing. And I remember hearing one song, Puppet Man, you know, ba 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 you know, and I went, oh, I remember that song, and I was, and then suddenly, I hear, ba ba bum bum bum, and chills came through me, and, and Marilyn McCoo, one of the most remarkable singers of, of, of the 20th century, absolutely clarion voice, gorgeous, beautiful voice, beautiful woman, wonderful, um, believing, Christian, uh, remarkable woman, starts to sing, you ask me if there'll come a time when I'll grow tired of you, never my love. And I went, and I just started crying. I just started crying. That's exactly what Shane was, had just finished saying, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. I will never leave you. And I didn't know how to end that act. Right. And here comes that song. And I went, that's it. That's it. And I must have played that song six times, Shandell, six, seven, maybe 10 times. And I just walked around listening to it over and over and over again. And I knew exactly what needed to be said before and what needed to be said after. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the real challenge was trying to get that song. Oh. Yeah, trying to, tr trying to be able to get permission to use that song. And um, that was, in a, of itself, was yet another miracle. And, um, you know, Marcy Gold, who's the vice president of Moonwater and also is a, a producer on the show. Marcy, Marcy and the Lord have a, have a relationship that is beyond comprehension she just she is so cued in to the will of god and 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 she comes boldly before the throne and asks for the most remarkable things you know some i'll ask for peace and wisdom and patience and she'll ask for the rights to a song by the fifth dimension and god will come through you know? wow. she's amazing so um at any rate, as you see, we got that song, and she was also unbelievably instrumental in, in the, the next impossible thing, which was getting the Billy Joel song. Yes, that was that song you've managed to make it reappear several times. Well, I'll tell you, the, the miracle of that song is that we were shooting that scene, and I was trying to figure out 
how many times are we going to force you know Boothie to walk down that aisle in that <laughs> and look emotional, right? Right. And I'm thinking, and we're we're trying to figure out a song that we can play just temporarily, so that something for her to walk, you know, almost rhythmically to. Mm. And it's Crystal. Crystal Lowe says, play that. You should play this thing and surprise her. Just that'll break her up. Just play, just play the Bill and Joel song. Oh, and I went, that's a great idea. So she was expecting something else altogether. And we played that on the, oh, wow. somebody pulled it up on their phone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Kristen, looked at me like, you've got to be kidding. Are you really oh. doing this to me? And she starts, you know, and you can see it and she starts to well up. And by golly, that's the song that we ended up with because it worked so perfectly. Mm. Yeah, that, I love that. <laughs> Just made all the sense in the world. I don't, I wish I had thought of it. I wish I could take credit for having thought of doing that song, but it was, uh, it was Crystal. I think I think that just shows the magic of of kind of the relationships and things that oh, you yeah. built and yeah. you have as like your own little independent unit, your own your own little family that she could just be like oh, yeah. exactly what like what that what would what would do it. What was it like being back together after three years? It was like no time had passed. It was remarkable. I can't believe you you say three years and it doesn't even compute with me. <laughs> of course, I spent you know all those three years working on that. So I was very much right. in the head, of, you know, my head was very much in that script already. But um, no, it just, I mean, I'd seen um, the actors on and off individually during, between that time, but not very often, uh, but we would connect and we'd text. And, but suddenly, I mean, there we all were in um, that night before we started shooting, and we met in the hotel uh, conference room and we set it all up the way we'd always done to, to um, uh, read the script together. Right. And, we, and we made every effort to make it feel as much as it always had, you know, despite the pandemic stuff, but we just made sure it was as close to any other reading we'd ever had. And we all sat in our old places automatically. <laughs> it was just, we and we made sure that we could get you know uh, Zach and and uh, uh, Gregory Harrison and just trying to make sure that as much of the family was there as we could get, and everybody read aloud. And uh, I had the weird feeling I ended up reading for uh, Sharon because because okay. uh, Sherry hadn't come to Vancouver yet, and that was a weird feeling to be reading my own. <laughs> lyrics my words out out there and you're like breaking the fourth wall almost yeah it was it was it you've was always weird. said that you, you do not wish to appear in your own your own content your own narrative you know it's very tempting but um people do it and i find it just bumps it, it's distracting and it takes people out of the story mm -hmm. and i don't ever want to do that not to mention i'm really not very good at it so <laughs> You know, I, I I would bump. I think, and that was anything that that disturbs the flow of the story is 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 unfair to the the person who's watching it. So, not that masses of people would go, "Oh, look, there's Martha Williamson," you know, walking through and getting you know in the background. But it just it just doesn't feel right to me, and it I I, I want to keep it as as honest as I can. And honest, honest, you've been, I mean, you think about these, there's, I guess now 23 different sign sealed deliver, delivered installments, 23 different stories. I mean, wow. think back to, I think you've told the story that it was, you started writing like that, what aired as the pilot at like 6 a.m. at your kitchen table. Did you, did you see this? Did you see everything that sort of SSD has become as, as a story, um, as a community, as the family that you sort of found within this cast? I did not imagine. Um, I did not s imagine the wider effect of the show at the time. Um, I do remember thinking we have an amazing cast. It was really we really worked hard to fight for it and um, to get just the right balance. I mean, right? It, I mean, even. Um, 
Jill Morrison is just perfect as Hazel. And every yeah. everybody is just who they needed to be. And it just made the, and, and you knew that you were gonna have something special just because of that. And uh, thank heavens, I, I know that the, the folks at Hallmark early on really recognized something special. They just were always uh, challenged to figure out what to do with it. Because if you recall, they really didn't have a lot of experience with episode, episodic television mm -hmm. the series. They were mm -hmm. really doing movies. So we, we came in a sort of an odd place, but I think in a weird way, it was a, a blessing that we stopped being a series and became a, a movie because then that allowed us to really get into the weeds emotional weeds of our, our actors. Otherwise it was just gonna be a little bit of, a, of, of the postables and a lot of you know, the, the letter of the week. And, uh, and I really like learning more about the postables. I, I like seeing where they go next. And I think you also got in, uh, into the weeds for people that were, are watching the show. They, you know, they definitely have connected with so many different little aspects of things. And I wonder, wonder if there's anything that you would want to say to that community, to say to the postables, just kind of as a closing thought. Of oh my goodness. Um, well, certainly thank you. Just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for um, all you've done to support and encourage the actors um, to uh, thank you for all you've all you've done to just keep the show alive to all the writing and the letter writing you've done and the tweeting and the posting and um, I, thank you for the incredibly kind letters and messages that I've received and again you know God's timing is perfect and and they have arrived uh, so often just when I needed. To, to get a little encouragement and say, keep doing what you're doing and trust that it's making a difference. Um, I think what I would say about, about to the postables is that we, you know, we don't know what the future is of this show. Nobody knows what the future um, holds for any of us. And I think that the fact that we were able to even do this show, um, you know, through this pandemic and to put out a, a quality show with under a lot of difficult circumstances um, is really truly a miracle. And it was, for me, it, was, it felt like writing this felt like giving a gift back, giving a gift back to, to our loyal postables. And you'll see that because of all the little you know, secret messages and the little Easter eggs and all of that, the, the words, just living letters. You know, we don't know how long the dead letter show is going to last, but we do know that through all of it, we've all discovered that we are living letters. And I just love that phrase because we are sent out into the world with something uh, that only we can tell. And then we have that obligation to tell it. And so you have that obligation to tell your story one way or the other, somehow, some way, and just as I do. And, and it doesn't have to be on television. It doesn't have to win an award. It doesn't have to have um, an audience, uh, but, but your story matters because you are here to tell it. God gave you a purpose in life and your story is all that you finally have to give that, that can last and that can change hearts and minds and souls and ultimately the future. I mean, I think that what I know about Sign Seal Delivered is that um, who knows what, what lies ahead for me? You know, I don't know. I mean, God forbid that I, you know, that something I might get hit by a bus tomorrow afternoon, but I know that, that I wrote my heart out and that people cut, cut pieces of that and that they'll always have that. You know, long after I'm gone, maybe somebody is gonna be saying, trust the timing. 
And uh, <laughs> whether they know where that came from, you know, they say, my, my mother always used to say, trust the timing. I don't know where that came from. And, and they may never know that she was a fan of Sign Seal Delivered, but ultimately some little kid somewhere may, may find themselves 50 years from now trusting the timing. And that's, that's all that matters. Well, thank you, Martha. That was a great way to sort of, <laughs> sort of like wrap this up. I don't think that could have that could have been, you know, any more perfectly, perfectly summed up. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me, to talk about the show. I, I feel like I've learned so much more than even I thought I kind of knew coming in. So this has been incredible. And I just, I just thank you so much for well, doing Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you again to everybody. Um, I, I, I hold a good thought and continue to pray that our future together is bright. I hope I pray so too. Okay. Thanks again. Much love. <laughs> Much love. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Martha Williamson. I hope you took away some great things from our chat. And I can't wait to keep breaking down or start, I guess, rather breaking down the vows we have made. Um, I'm looking at doing some things in some new formats that are maybe a little different than what you've seen before. So they're taking a little longer than normal, but I can't wait to, to start breaking everything down and sharing it with you guys. So keep staying tuned to A&D, keep being excellent and being kind to each other. And I will see you soon.